I am so glad you're here because today we're diving into a really cool topic in organic chemistry. We're going to be learning all about electrocyclic reactions and sigmatropic rearrangements. These are like little magic tricks that molecules can do, and we're going to uncover their secrets today. Not only are we going to learn about the mechanisms for these reactions, but we'll also look at the stereochemical outcomes depending on whether or not these reactions take place under heat or photochemical conditions. And then at the end, I have some practice problems that should help for your next exam. Electrocyclic reactions are also termed ring opening or ring closing reactions. Additionally, they involve the bond making of a sigma bond. Consider this six-membered chain of carbon atoms, carbon and hydrogen, that contains one, two, three different alkenes. Remember that bonds around sigma bonds can actually rotate. So this carbon chain doesn't have to exist in this kind of zigzag formation. In fact, it can orient in such a way to look like this molecule above. Both of these are the same, and they're just rotating around in space around the sigma bonds. Once they adopt this conformation, what can happen is that the pi electrons, which remember are delocalized, can actually move about to form a brand new cyclic structure, which has only two double bonds in it. So this is what is called an electrocyclic reaction. And again, the pi electrons are moving around the ring, allowing us to generate this brand new sigma bond and leaving behind two different pi bonds. The same thing would be true if we had a structure that looked like this, where what can actually happen is these pi electrons can move to form a brand new four-membered ring that contains one pi bond. So notice that overall we are gaining a sigma bond in each of these. So one sigma bond is being formed in each and we are losing one of the initial pi bonds. So minus one for the pi bonds plus one for the sigma bonds. Let's consider one such example where we have the same molecule. However, we have substituents on the terminal carbon alkene. So if we are to consider what might happen under the presence of heat, for example, the electrocyclic reaction that occurs will still produce that six-membered ring, which is going to have the two different alkenes on it. However, in this scenario, the likely conformer that is going to be formed is going to be the one where we have both of the methyl group substituents coming out at you. So these are going to be cis to one another, where the stereochemistry we draw as a wedge indicating that it's coming out at you. And this is the isomer that's likely to be formed, as opposed to an isomer where you have both of those substituents trans to one another. So the product that could be formed with both substituents going in this direction is not the one that's likely to be formed, at least using heat. Now to understand why, we actually need to take a molecular orbital approach and think about what are the HOMO or the highest occupied molecular orbital that we would draw in a molecular orbital diagram for this molecule that contains three different alkenes. Remember, your molecular orbital diagram is going to have three bonding molecular orbitals and three anti-bonding molecular orbitals, at least when looking at the pi electrons. So the first one that's formed is going to be the one where all of the six p orbitals are going in the exact same direction and they are completely aligned and all of them are bonding. The next one is going to contain one node and that will be here. So instead this molecular orbital would have four of the orbitals going in the same direction and then two of them would be going in the opposite direction. And then for the next lowest energy molecular orbital, we're going to have two nodes. So remember, it goes zero nodes, then one node, then two node, and that's how we get our order when we look at our energy diagram. So this molecular orbital is actually going to be one in which you have two going in the same direction, followed by two going in the opposite direction, and then followed by two going in that original direction. And this is going to be actually our HOMO because we have six pi electrons. This one is going to be our highest occupied molecular orbital. And in organic chemistry, it's important to look at those frontier molecular orbitals because it's usually the HOMO or the LUMO that's involved in a molecular reaction. So now that we know what the HOMO looks like, let's try to draw it on this molecule to see how these orbitals might interact. So now that we've identified that this is the HOMO, I'm actually going to redraw this molecule. And instead, I'm going to draw it in an orientation that helps us easily visualize those molecular orbitals. And remember, each of the methyl substituents are going in opposite directions. One's going up, one's going down. So in this case, drawn this way, one would be going left and one would be going right. Now we can take these molecular orbitals 
we'll draw the first set, the first two going in the same direction, the next two will be going in the opposite direction, and then these two will be going in the same direction as the ones on the left. And this is how our HOMO actually looks on the molecule. Now remember, in this electrocyclic reaction, what is happening is we're forming a brand new sigma bond between these two carbons that contain the substituents. Those are the carbons right here. Remember that sigma bonds follow the overlap of two atomic orbitals along the internuclear axis, which means these two p orbitals will have to rotate in such a way that we align their orbitals along this internuclear axis. And hopefully you can see the only way this would occur, since both of these shaded lobes are pointing in the upwards direction, are as if they came and rotated downwards to point at one another so that they would eventually look like this. So they would be going in the vertical direction, and rotate in opposite directions to get to the horizontal direction. And from here, this orbital would be moving to the right, and this orbital would be moving to the left. And when we do that, notice that since this orbital is moving to the right, this substituent is gonna move upwards. And since this orbital is moving to the left, that's gonna push this substituent also in that same direction. So then if we were to redraw that, after showing that we have formed that new sigma bond, where both of these orbitals are pointing along the internuclear axis, this means that both of those substituents would be pointing upwards. And because of that, they are cis to one another, which is why we drew our product initially in the cis conformation, and we said that this is the isomer that is formed via this electrocyclic reaction. This type of rotation actually has a special name. It's called disro Rotatory. So disrotatory is when you have both of these orbitals moving in opposite directions. One is moving to the right, one is moving to the left, so it's rotating in opposite ro rotation, so we call that disrotatory. So remember, that reaction was under the presence of heat. When we're using heat, this is our molecular orbital diagram. However, I also mentioned that we'll be talking about reactions that occur under the presence of light, or a photochemical reaction. Remember that what happens when light comes in and shines, an electron, a single electron, is excited into the next lowest energy molecular orbital. So this is going to remove one electron from here and place it in this orbital. Now we have actually changed what our HOMO is. So our new HOMO is no longer this one. Our new HOMO becomes this molecular orbital. So for a photochemical reaction, we need to consider what this molecular orbital would look like since that's the one involved in a chemical reaction. Remember, we started by having no nodes in our lowest energy molecular orbital. Then we had one node in our next lowest energy orbital. And then we had two different nodes between our original HOMO or our next lowest molecular orbital. So since we went from zero to one to two, this one should have three different nodes. And for that reason, I can draw this molecular orbital as having a node here. Now I'm going to showcase Basically, everything else remains the same. We just rotated or flipped that one, and this is actually going to give us our three nodes. So we have one, two, three nodes, whereas initially we only had one and two. So our new HOMO molecular orbital looks like this. So now let's again redraw this structure in a way where we can actually visualize what this situation may look like. Remember, our substituents are still going in opposite directions. We will populate the molecular orbital diagram similar to how we did before. However, this time we're going to use our new molecular orbital since we have a new HOMO. And this is going to place the orbitals in such a way where they look like this. And now notice that in order for these orbital lobes to align their phasing or the shading, they are now going to rotate in a different direction. So for example, this lobe needs to move in this direction to the right, and this lobe needs to move in this direction. Now notice that the rotation of these orbitals are moving in a counterclockwise rotation. So remember, counterclockwise is this direction. So this one is moving like this, this one is moving in this direction, both of which are counterclockwise. For that reason, this is called con-rotatory. Notice that this is con-rotatory, not dis-rotatory, where they were both moving 
in the opposite directions or the clockwise fashion. So both are moving counterclockwise, both are moving the same direction. Therefore, this is called con rotatory. Now let's think about what happens to these substituents. Notice that if this one is moving in this direction, it will eventually move to face down. And this substituent is still moving in this direction, so it's going to be faced up. Therefore, when we form this new sigma bond, what this actually ends up looking like is going to be a situation where one of the substituents is moving down and one of these substituents is going in the upwards direction. This means that the predominant structure that's formed under the presence of light instead of heat is actually going to be a regioisomer that is in fact trans to one another. So in order to generate the trans isomer, we need to use a photochemical reaction as opposed to heat. Sigmatropic rearrangements come from the root word tropos, which in Greek means change. So we're getting a change in a location of a sigma bond, sigma tropic. And in doing so, we generate a molecule which looks very similar. However, we have broken one of the sigma bonds and made an entirely new sigma bond. And remember, these pi electrons allow us to delocalize those electrons in order to generate this molecule. So here's the electron pushing arrows that allow us to generate our new product. When all six members of this transformation or this rearrangement are carbon atoms, that's called a cope rearrangement. So a cope rearrangement is when all the atoms are carbon. There's also another type of reaction that is called a Claisen rearrangement when this is an analog that contains an oxygen atom. So consider, for example, if we had an oxygen as part of the structure and we still underwent that transformation, what we would generate under the presence of heat is now going to be a brand new carbon-oxygen double bond and we'll still be left with a single alkene. So this is called a Claisen rearrangement. An important class of these Claisen rearrangements is going to contain a benzene ring as well as an allylic fragment coming off of the oxygen atom. So again, we have this allylic fragment as well as a benzene ring. What can happen in this example is these pi electrons move in such a way where it looks like we've actually taken off this allylic fragment and attached it to our initial ring. So this would generate a brand new carbon-oxygen double bond, leaving us with two pi bonds inside of our cyclic structure, as well as our allylic fragment. Subsequently, this can undergo a tautomerization with this hydrogen atom and our carbon-oxygen double bond to regenerate our benzene ring, leaving behind an alcohol as well, as well as our allylic fragment. And notice that we have regenerated this benzene ring, which is the driving force for this tautomerization. Because this benzene ring is fully aromatic and is going to be lower in energy, this is going to be the driving force that allows this reaction to occur under the presence of heat. Now let's try some practice problems to gauge your understanding. Pause the video, try these problems independently, then resume the video to check the solutions. An important table to keep in mind anytime you're thinking about the stereochemical outcomes of an electrocyclic reaction are depicted for you on the screen. The horizontal rows can be separated by any time you have a system that has four pi electrons versus six pi electrons. What will be the outcomes if you're using heat or delta as opposed to a photochemical reaction which uses light or H nu? A four pi electro electrocyclic reaction proceeding under heat is going to proceed via a con rotatory type of rotation. And for a six pi electron system, it's going to proceed via a disrotatory. Under light, it's going to be the opposite. So disrotatory for a four pi electron system and con rotatory for a six pi electron system. Remember, con rotatory means that they're both moving counterclockwise. So if we were to draw in our molecular orbitals, again, we only need to really focus on the ones at the end. If they're both going to be moving con rotatory, this means both of them will be moving in this direction. That means the shaded lobe should be here and the shaded lobe should be here. This way, when this one rotates and this one is also rotating counterclockwise, they will align along this internuclear axis. This means that for the substituents, in this case, it was CH2 phenyl, so like a, a benzyl substituent, CH2 phenyl. This means that this one is going to end up moving in the downward direction, and this substituent is going to be moving in the upwards direction. This is going to give rise to a situation where we have the trans substituents. So the trans substituents will be the ones given here, 
and this is indicated by the rotation, which is con rotatory under this system, because we know that we were a six pi system. So the six pi system means that there were three double bonds, six pi in total, and you were told that this was proceeding under the presence of light or a photochemical reaction. Remember, a Claisen rearrangement Claisen is going to be a sigmatropic rearrangement that contains oxygen as part of the system. Remember, sigmatropic means changing of a sigma bond. So we're going to be losing a sigma bond and making it somewhere else. And we can just follow the pi electrons to see how that might occur. So these pi electrons will come here. That means that these pi electrons will move to make our new carbon-oxygen double bond, which is typically going to be formed in a Claisen rearrangement. That means that these electrons will move to this position and that is going to help us follow along and figure out what is the, the structure of our new product. So let's start on this piece because I think it'll be easier for you to visualize what the product will be under these circumstances. So we have formed that new carbon oxygen bond which was located here. We've made our new sigma bond at this position and notice that now we have a double bond here because these electrons have moved to being a double bond at that location and then the rest of our molecule just contains our cyclopentane ring with the sigma bond connecting the two. And this is actually our final structure. And we were able to figure that out just by following the movement of electrons, seeing what new bonds are being formed and what bonds are being broken. And because a Claisen rearrangement is a sigma tropic rearrangement, we knew that what we're having is the making of a new sigma bond at this location and the breaking of an old sigma bond at this location. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my channel for more chemistry content. And comment down below if you have any questions about this this video or anything else related to chemistry and I'd be happy to help you out. I'll see you in the next video.